Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Weston, and I'm here to present um, my thoughts and approaches on how to build efficiencies into Drupal practices. Um, how has everyone's con gone so far? We made it to the, the last day of sessions, the last session block. I'm sure there's a lot of session fatigue at this point. But hopefully, um, we'll be able to give you, I'll be able to give you some really good uh, ideas and information uh, through this uh, presentation. Um, you know, some of the presentations I've seen, even in the project management track, have been amazing. Uh, so I hope that I can uh, provide you with uh, either a good summation of some of the things that you've heard this week, or maybe even give you some new ideas that you can take back uh, to your uh, home organizations. Um, if you want to follow along in the slides today, uh, I have this presentation set up on GitHub. The address is node loophole.github.io. And that's my assistant, Mordecai. He likes to uh, help me when I do my Drupal coding. And I'll have this URL on the next few slides as well if you want to follow along. Uh, as I said before, I'm Scott Weston. I am a solution architect at HS2 Solutions in Chicago. Um, I've been doing Drupal since early uh, Drupal 6. Before going to HS2 Solutions, I led a small Drupal practice also in Chicago. Um, in my free time, I enjoy bowling and darts, and I've recently picked up running, uh, which is going pretty well so far. Uh, as I said before, I, worked at, uh, I work at HS2 Solutions, and at HS2 Solutions, we strive to be uh, really a trusted, responsive, and effective digital transformation partner to some of the best companies on the planet. We do this by valuing smart strategy, great design, awesome engineering teams, and uh, working with people that are passionate about what we do, and our clients, and our partner agencies. So the purpose for my talk today is uh, I want to give you some information and thoughts and ideas about how uh, I've seen that we've made our Drupal practices more efficient. Now, I don't think I'm going to cover anything revolutionary or groundbreaking for you today. Uh, but I hope I can provide you with information that you, again, can take back uh, to your practice and help it become more efficient. And I framed the fr presentation today around four main questions. What types of skills make up a great Drupal team? What are some practical ways that a Drupal team can increase their efficiencies? Uh, how can a Drupal team stay motivated when uh, being asked to do a lot of, of work, especially under deadlines? And how can project managers uh, help with efficiency. So let's just dive right in and start talking about skills. Uh, the basics are really straightforward. Uh, we have the direct skills that any person needs to be able to perform their job. So PHP, knowing some Drupal, knowing a lot of Drupal in some cases, uh, CSS, JavaScript, Symfony, Git, those just kind of meat and potatoes things. And then there's also the related skills, which are the frameworks. Uh, knowing some DevOps if needed, some server management, uh, knowing things like search APIs, knowing how to interact with REST or SOAP, those sorts of related skills are always helpful. But there's this other area that I call soft skills. I think uh, it's just kind of a term of art. And these are skills that aren't easily measured. They're not objectively measured. Uh, they're more subjective. And these skills are sometimes overlooked, maybe in the interview process, or overlooked if um, a developer or someone on the team is, is a rock star in many other ways, but they're lacking some of these skills. I say that some of these soft skills can be just as important as the direct skills that um, an individual may have. And when, when, uh, as we go through these skills, if you'll see these traits that people have, you can see how having them can help your team function at higher level and with more efficiency. I think the first and most common one that everyone mentions is communication. Uh, so this is, can an individual articulate ideas and thoughts, uh, speak up if they're having problems, uh, do they engage in active listening, and do they understand the message uh, being conveyed to them and understand really what they're conveying to other people. Um, another kind of facet to this is the using, using the correct voice. So an example I like to give is, 
if you have two developers that are talking to one another, they're gonna have a really technical conversation using very technical terms, uh, and packed into that are a lot of assumptions of what the other person knows. But if you put a developer in a situation where they need to explain a technical concept or a technical uh, framework to someone who's less technically minded, you want to um, you know, ensure that your developers can do that and not uh, be uh, you know, uh, too abrasive about it or too uh, condescending about it at times uh, if someone doesn't know a technical term or a concept. So you really want to look for those people that can uh, articulate those things. Uh, another one, another facet of, of uh, another trait of people that uh, I like to find is have uh, people that have a bias towards action. Uh, and this is just people uh, that, it, you know, someone that is ready to get their hands dirty and start solving problems. Uh, as we probably all know, in Drupal, there are 10 ways to do any single thing. Um, and, and there does need to be a balance between research and discussions and uh, actually taking the action to do it. So you want to find people that know how to do the right amount of research and deliberation and, and then make a decision and run with it. Uh, you want to uh, try to avoid uh, situations where you put someone in uh, and a space where they have decision paralysis, if they have 15 different options of a way to approach something and they can't make a decision, you want to make sure that you are empowering people uh, and giving them uh, the confidence that they need to know that you're gonna stand behind the, uh, the decision that they make and you're gonna you know, work with them to see that, that uh, decision and that approach uh, through to the end. Another trait that people, uh, I, I feel, need to uh, exude when they are um, working on a team is the, the trait of constant learning and constant mentoring. So you want to find people and you want to encourage in people uh, a growing knowledge and experience, growing their knowledge and experience uh, to a higher level. Someone who is, is constantly striving to learn more and uh, learn more about their craft, learn more about the related skills, is better prepared to solve potential problems before they become really big problems. And this proactive response to situations helps minimize rework, bugs, and problems down the road. Uh, someone that recognizes the value of, of sharing information with others is an asset to your team as well. Uh, they know that doing so, sharing information, elevates everybody, elevates the entire team. And in that respect, your team as a whole becomes more knowledgeable and more efficient. And someone who takes ownership knows uh, their responsibility to see a task through to completion. If they don't have the necessary resources or information, they find them or they find it. Um, and as a project manager, or another team member, you should have confidence in knowing that when a developer or a team member takes on a task, that they will see it through to completion. Of course, if there are blockers, they should surface those to the team. And if they are uh, not full blockers, maybe just speed bumps, they should try to work through those uh, so that that task or that assignment can be completed. And a developer or team member should be able to know where their focus should be at any given time. This is particularly useful when, let's say, a developer is on multiple projects. Knowing of their competing priorities, which one is most important, is critical. Uh, part, of, part of focus is also the ability to say no, or not right now, to incoming requests that uh, don't help achieve the highest priority for that, that person at that time. And some developers are people pleasers. I know I fall into that category at times. And if I get requests coming in, I want to be, be the go-to guy to get things done. Uh, so sometimes it's hard to say no to someone, uh, especially if it's a close colleague. Uh, but having that, that skill, that trait to know that I have to do this other thing and I must say no to you for right now, uh, that's important. Also important is the ability to push away distractions and uh, other, uh, other sources of, of um, wanting your attention. So this would be social media, 
uh, you know, email continually popping up and you're just going to check it uh, constantly, things like that. Just knowing when to, to shut those things off and move uh, on to the work at hand, uh, that's, that's important. So kind of the takeaways for this section for me are when interviewing job applicants, um, you know, ask questions that will uncover, obviously, the direct skills, but also some of these soft skills. So for example, assume you are uh, involved in the interview process for a developer, and you want to tease out if, if this person has good communication skills. You could, you could pose a question something like, assume I'm not a technical person. Please explain to me how views in Drupal works. And you, you may know how views works, you may not know how views works, but just from the tone and the content of that response, you should be able to know, does this person have the ability to, to articulate uh, technical concepts in a non-technical way? So you want to frame uh, interview questions around those, uh, those traits to just know if uh, the, the candidate is someone that would be well-suited for your team. And then with your existing team members, look for opportunities to highlight and encourage and strengthen these traits when you see uh, one of these uh, behaviors exemplified uh, that you want to, to enforce uh, within your team. So once you kind of know what you're wanting to look for uh, from the direct skills and, and the, the soft skills, uh, another aspect is to just make an assessment of your current state of the Drupal team that you have. Um, and this is an opportunity for you to have a good baseline measure for where your team stands today. And it's also important to be, to be very honest about this. This is going to be internal. This isn't going to be posted on your website. Um, and it will, it will really inform your organization about the strengths and the weaknesses uh, within your Drupal practice. Uh, you know, first you want to look at technical knowledge. So, you know, if, if we're talking about Drupal practices, we need to, to assess Drupal skills. And uh, when, when doing Drupal skills, you want, to be, you want to get really specific. You don't want to just say, do they know Drupal 7? Do they know Drupal 8? Do they know front end? Do they know back end? You want to like, dive deep into this. Uh, and you want to know, uh, ask very specific questions like, does this person have skill creating field formatters? Do they know how to use twig templates? Do they know configuration management? Do they know uh, how to write an event subscriber? Do they know how to work with render arrays? Um, and and if, if the project managers in here uh, can take this information back to the, the practice leads uh, at your organizations, they'll, they'll kind of get the gist of, of what we're looking for. At HS2, we uh, started a skills assessment of our, of our Drupal team. And we, I think we had 120 data points that we were collecting on each person related to the, the skills that they had in very specific areas. So you can get very granular uh, with this. And then for courses and certifications and awards, uh, you, you'll want to collect and maintain a list of those uh, as new certifications are uh, bestowed upon your, your team members, add those to the list. And yeah, I, I, on the last slide, I know I said that this was for internal only, but, but for the courses and certifications and awards, these can be a really good selling point to pot, uh, potential clients. Uh, so uh, they can be very helpful in, in uh, responses to uh, proposals and, or uh, asking for proposals. And when someone gets a new award or a new certification or completes a course, that's something that the entire te team should be celebrating. Uh, you really need to create a, an atmosphere where uh, victories are celebrated by everyone, not just those that, that achieve something. Uh, also a part of the assessment is, is domain knowledge, is what I'm calling this. And this, this can include uh, work that members of your team have done in other industries before they worked for you or worked as a developer. Uh, it can also include the type of websites or types of clients that each individual has worked with. Um, an example here would be, let's say that one of your developers worked at a financial firm, an accounting firm, uh, before arriving at your door. 
they may have some information about regulatory matters uh, related to financial firms that when you're trying to uh, pitch to a, a, an accounting firm to do their website, uh, they may have some, not necessarily insider information, but they have some insight into to some of those things. And you can surface that during the, the pitch to let, let your client know that you have expertise within that domain. And that can, that can definitely help um, the selling process. And also, knowing this kind of information uh, can be helpful in knowing how to staff new projects that are, that are coming in uh, as well. Uh, for assessing the, the Drupal talent in your, on your Drupal team, some takeaways here. You know, after, after you've done this, you should have a sense of what type of work to go for and which ones would be the, kind of the low-hanging fruit uh, to go after. Uh, you should have a good uh, metric uh, of, of your team's strengths and weaknesses and being able to find ways to improve. Uh, you should be able to identify some concrete next steps that your, your team should take uh, to help them level up. And, and kind of at the culmination of all this, you should have a, a nice roadmap for improving your team. And it's, it's more than just having that roadmap. You need to work it and, and you know, get the knowledge and information and experience uh, leveled up uh, so that uh, your, your team as a whole increases its, its knowledge. Um, so getting in kind of the, into the, the guts of uh, what we're talking about today uh, is you know, increasing efficiency in, in your Drupal process. Um, and I'm gonna take one step back uh, and, and just highlight that efficiency and productivity are not the same thing. They are related, but they're, they're, those terms should not be used interchangeably. Uh, productivity is a, a measurement of number of units produced. Number of units produced could be number of lines of code, number of tickets cleared, number of story points completed in a sprint. Uh, it could be uh, anything along those lines. And then efficiency is how much resources or how many resources were used uh, in, in the production of that unit. And the way to increase efficiency is to reduce waste within the system. And when we're talking about development and programming, uh, you know, waste could be, uh, you know, a very specific example would be dealing with a slow development environment. If you could speed up the development environment, you might gain some efficiencies there. Uh, or reducing the amount of bugs that are generated uh, or n uh, the amount of refactoring that is needed because of um, maybe ambiguous uh, requirements or uh, some uh, improper assumptions that were made on behalf of a developer when looking at wireframes. So anything you can do to uh, reduce the waste within the, the system, uh, you increase the capacity to do production to produce more. So with that in mind, uh, as, I, as I keep talking about efficiency, know that I want to, I'm wanting to give you the tools that you need to increase that efficiency so that you can produce more with the same uh, amount of time and staff that you have now. So before a project even starts to, to build, um, it's good to have a meeting with the, in the, the build team and just make sure that everybody agrees on the work to be done. And this can you know, highlight what's in scope, what's not in scope. So for example, if you, if you have wireframes that contemplate multiple phases of a project, and we're talking about you know, phase one right now, uh, be sure to highlight the things uh, within the wireframes or within the requirements that are out of scope in that current phase. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick a pin in that, uh, talking about multiple phases. I'm gonna come back to that uh, a little later. Uh, another, another common, uh, you know, point for everyone to be on the same page about is what does done look like for this project? Is it a proof of concept? Is it an MVP? Or is it a fully fleshed out site? So as long as everyone's on the same page of what done looks like, that helps um, keep everyone focused in the right direction. And then uh, have common names for, for everything on, on the project. So uh, a perfect example I can give is uh, I was recently on a, a project for uh, a, a website, and I'm going to use ambiguous terms to talk about this. We have this thing at the top of the page that had a big hero image and some text on it, 
and every five seconds it switched out to another image. I called it a hero rotator. Uh, someone else on the team was calling it a carousel. Someone else was calling it a slideshow. And we had these terms in our head about what we were calling this thing. And so we were having a meeting, and, and I was talking about a hero rotator, and you know, my colleague was talking about a carousel, and I thought he was talking about something else. So we had to like have a level set of, okay, this is the thing we're talking about, right? The thing, and we had to point on the wireframe to this is the thing. So if you can, if you can have you know common understanding of what things are called, uh, that's great. Another example is uh, I, uh, with more than one client of mine, and I've worked with, uh, th they call. Uh, a region on a page that does something like a newsletter sign up form or uh, related stories, a block on the page that does something, they call that a module. Um, and in the Drupal space, a module is something totally different. So even aligning what you're calling things between the client and the team is helpful. And you may have to make a, a translation table and say, okay, when the client says module, they mean this, uh, just so that there's a common understanding uh, so that there's no miscommunication or reducing the possibility for miscommunication uh, among the team and with the client. Uh, also, before the build starts, there should be a solid plan. The lead developer or the architect, the Drupal architect uh, for that project uh, should create a plan uh, for the team to follow. And in this, it sh you should resolve as many unanswered questions as possible. Um, a, a smart Drupal architect uh, or senior developer, lead developer, uh, will be able to look at wireframes, look at requirements, and really uh, have some, some long distance vision and try to, to ask questions that, that can be problems later on, especially if wireframes aren't uh, 100, don't have 100% fidelity, uh, if they were uh, just kind of inspirational wireframes, uh, so to speak. And along with the plan should be a, a solid content model, uh, and that includes things like content types, taxonomy vocabularies. Um, I would also say roles and permissions, uh, modules to use, modules that will need to be built, custom things. Um, and I do want to point out um, uh, a few years ago, I think maybe more than a few years ago, Palantir.net uh, published a, a blog post, and I've linked uh, it here, and you can get it in the slides as well. Uh, to uh, a blog post about a build specification. And they, they shared a, a Google Doc that is their build specification. And, and, and to be honest, it's, it's a little dated. It's for Drupal 7. Uh, but it can be, you know, you can copy it and adapt it for your particular needs. I think it, I would recommend this as a great starting point for creating that kind of nuts and bolts build spec plan. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, another way to increase efficiency uh, when you're actually doing the build is to have standard tools and processes. Um, so standardize the toolkit for everybody. Uh, and I go so far as to say computers, IDE, uh, other software that, that is used in your, in your practice uh, should all be the same. So if everyone's on, on Windows or everyone's on Mac or everyone's on Linux, that helps a lot. Uh, that means the team can actually help each other. Uh, and they would, in, in theory, have the same problems and be able to, to help solve those quickly. Um, and then the development environment, uh, everyone should be working on the same type of development environment, whether it's Acquia Dev Desktop, Drupal VM, or some uh, kind of homegrown uh, vagrant machine that you have. Um, and it should, as a side note, it should closely match uh, as much as possible the actual production environment so that behaviors are the same between dev and, and uh, uh, production. And I would also recommend having uh, across the entire practice and the entire organization having the same project or task management process in place as much as possible. We know uh, the, for particular clients, for particular projects, there are some, some little nuances. But insofar as you can, have it the same across the entire, uh, entire organization. And kind of going along with the, the last, last point of, of having common toolkit, have a common starting point for all of your projects. And this is, this is probably some of the most Drupal-y stuff that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so uh, I can describe what we do at HS2 Solutions uh, in some detail. So, uh, maybe this gives you some inspiration or ideas that you can take back. 
so at HS2 Solutions, we have a base Drupal installation profile that we use for Drupal 7 sites and Drupal 8 sites. And what we've kind of baked into our secret sauce in, the, in this installation profile uh, are the modules that we know 90% of our sites are going to, to install uh, just a matter of, of doing you know, a website these days. So things like Google Analytics. Uh, in Drupal 7, you know, having Path Auto, uh, just any of those kind of common give me modules that every site has, we have baked in an installation profile that takes care of that. I'm sure many of your organizations do that as well. If you don't, I would recommend uh, going for that. Uh, it gives you a common starting point, um, and it gives you, uh, you know, for the industries that you work with, the areas that you work within, the, the spaces you work within, it gives you a leg up uh, on, on the build-out, which makes things much more efficient. Uh, because one of the things we want to do is reduce the repetitive work or the duplicative work uh, from one project to the next. Uh, and going along with that, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, <laughs> And particularly with ambitious developers, this is a, this is a, a problem sometimes. I can, I can say that from my personal experience in my younger development days. Um, you know, try to avoid doing, doing things radically different each time you build a site. Uh, the example I always like to give is that hero image rotator thing that we were talking about a little bit ago. How many different ways can you really build that? You know, why are we building it from scratch every time we're building it? Why don't we establish you know what we're going to use whether it's um, you know some carousel uh, JavaScript library or some home homegrown uh, solution and let's just run with it and then we can we can build on it and iterate on it so uh, to incorporate new features that come in into play for the particular projects that we work on and leveraging the knowledge you have rather than investigating new uh, things at times uh, is good sometimes it's it's you know it's it's appropriate to uh, do something totally new and totally radical, and that's great, but sometimes it's also good to stay the course. Um, as project managers, uh, you know, this is something I can, uh, for you guys as a developer talking to project managers, um, as much as you can, let developers develop. Um, so, and in your organization, you know, I, obviously every situation is different, uh, but, you know, there are, little things that add up in a developer's life really quickly. Things like, um, oh hey, can you go look at the printer and see what you can, see if you can make it print my, my spreadsheet for me? Or, you know, meetings where uh, the de developer doesn't really have a role or have an objective uh, of takeaways in that meeting. Um, you know, if you, if you have an hour long status meeting with a client and the developer, you want the developer in there just in case some technical questions come up. It might be a better use of time uh, to let the developer develop for that hour and then have a 15 minute follow up uh, with, the, with the appropriate stakeholders if there are some technical questions that come out of a meeting. Uh, things like that. And it's also okay to have, have specialists on your staff. And, and I'm not talking about putting people into a silo. So if someone says, okay, Scott, you know search APIs like nobody else in this organization, so any project that does search, we're putting you on that project. That's, that's not, not what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm talking about is knowing that I'm that resource, knowing that Scott's that resource, if someone has questions or problems or needs pointers on how to address search API questions, for example, uh, and, and surfacing that to the entire team so that uh, you have that well of resources uh, across the team uh, that, that others can plug into. Uh, and this one's kind of a, a, a gimme, uh, you know, follow good development practices, so do the basics, do them well. Uh, this includes coding standards, peer review, documentation, uh, doing things the Drupal way. And how this really helps with efficiency is if I'm airdropped into another project, uh, I don't have to orient myself with how uh, the project is, is built. Uh, if, we, if I know we're following coding standards, I know how to find the code that I need to find. If we're doing things the Drupal way, I know what hooks to look for or what event subscribers to look for, or what, um, you know, if the organization follows certain naming conventions for uh, custom modules, I know what to look for. Uh, so that, that can help with efficiency, especially when transitioning off uh, or onto new projects. Uh, next is to build with the future in mind, uh, and, and 
a little while ago, I, I said I was going to put a pin in, in wireframes that had phase, future phases uh, baked into it. Uh, so I'm coming back to that now. So where possible, if you know where the site or the project is going uh, that you're building out, uh, and you can lay that foundation today in phase one for phase two, that's, that's a great win for, uh, for you and the team as well as for the client. Uh, example I like to give for that is, let's say that you're building on a site that has uh, kind of a help and how-to uh, how to section, uh, just articles about how to do random things. A and let's say in phase one, uh, you're going to have a field that is uh, skill level. So basic, you know, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And in phase one, it's just going to appear as a label at the top of the article, that this is an intermediate article, for example. Uh, it, you know, it'd be the, the easy route is to just build a select list field and populate it with beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and then just display it. But if you know in phase two that there's going to be a uh, help and how to landing page where uh, some dynamic content will need to come into play, maybe a full description of about what the difference between basic and intermediate and advanced is, uh, you might want to go ahead and build that out as a, as a vocabulary, a taxonomy vocabulary, and create that entity reference. That way, when phase two comes along, you don't have to do any data migration, you don't have to destroy anything that you built in phase one, and the, you've laid the groundwork with minimal additional effort uh, for that future phase. Uh, another uh, aspect is to invest in everyone's continued growth, and this is talking about uh, experience as well as just uh, knowledge. So investing in training and education uh, within your organization, uh, encouraging people to attend or maybe even hosting local events like meetups uh, or camps, and then also having internal training. So just uh, at HS2 Solutions, we have a quarterly Drupal meetup uh, that's just internal to the company. So we all converge on, on uh, home base, and we uh, have a, a one-day or two-day meeting where we talk about how we do Drupal, what, what projects we've worked on, things that we've learned, and just a really good internal information share. It's basically like a mini camp, but it's just for our company. Uh, and that springboards into uh, contributing back to the wider Drupal community uh, through uh, presentations at camps and cons. Uh, and also uh, for project managers here, as much as you can, uh, help people avoid multitasking as much as possible. So this is working on multiple projects uh, seemingly at the same time. Uh, there are definitely real-time costs to task switching, uh, so it's better to time box efforts into larger chunks if possible. And as much as developers will fuss and fight, uh, if, you have, if you know you're going to have multiple meetings with a developer over the course of a day because of project kickoffs and status meetings and that, try to schedule those back to back to back so that uh, everything's compact as far as meetings go. And that gives a bigger chunk throughout the day for uh, doing development work. Um, and, and you may have to uh, explain the why uh, for that, but uh, that, that is actually helpful, better than having meetings staggered throughout the day uh, where there, there are seemingly small chunks where I could, uh, or a developer could develop. Uh, uh, Another one, and this one hopefully is, is common sense and obvious, but fix bugs immediately uh, as they're uncovered. Uh, if, if you build on top of bugs, uh, it may cause more bugs, and then you'll have like an infestation, and that's not good. Uh, and if you ever hear the phrase, we'll fix it in QA, it's a very dangerous phrase to hear, and you, wanna, you, you definitely want to tamp that down and get that idea out of people's head as quickly as possible. Uh, letting bugs linger, can only cause more problems. So for increasing efficiency, some takeaways, you know, look for, for opportunities within your, your Drupal process uh, to, to increase efficiency. Look for the things that are inefficient. Um, try to eliminate dupli uh, duplicate or um, repetitive effort where possible. Try to automate some things, get some nice um, uh, starting points set up for uh, the practice and invest in people, uh, letting them work and also let them work the work. Those are kind of the key takeaways for me uh, in keeping, um, keeping the team efficient. Um, and 
Sometimes developers are called upon to do some pretty heroic things related to timelines, um, working a lot and, and that sort of thing. So, so how do you keep a team motivated? Uh, and, and you don't want to, you know, you want to avoid overworking people and you also want to give them something new and exciting to work on. So uh, what, can, what can we do? And some of these are, are pretty basic. One is strive for daily productivity, uh, daily production. Um, when, I, when I do a task decomposition for a project, I try to keep uh, any single task uh, at less than one day to complete. So if you have a, if you have a task that's like a multi-day task that you know it's going to take you know, 12 or 14 hours or longer to complete, uh, try to break that down into smaller chunks. And if, if, you, if you look, you, you definitely can find ways of doing that. Uh, and there's two reasons for this. One is it gives developers the ability to check something off and say, yesterday I completed this thing. Um, and instead of, uh, it, the, the other aspect of it is also, if you give someone too much, too, too big of a bite to chew, they don't know where to start on it at times. So uh, definitely try to break things down as much as possible. Uh, also try to, as much as possible, uh, encourage a good work-life balance. Uh, while, while it can initially be productive, uh, working lots of hours can be inefficient with increased stress, uh, mistakes, bugs, things are missed, uh, and, and it's really not sustainable in, in the long term. Uh, another, another thing to do is, is make sure that everyone knows why they are doing something. You don't have to be, you know, sometimes it's obvious uh, the why, uh, you know, why am I building this content type? You, that's kind of an obvious thing, uh, but sometimes if you hear someone say, well, why am I doing this? Uh, that, that's, that's a sign that that person is ready to be demotivated, uh, that they're looking for a reason to, to lose their motivation to work uh, on that project. So it's, it's good to have a conversation uh, and explain why or how what that developer is doing fits into the larger picture. And you could also tease out maybe better ways of approaching something. Uh, maybe the why am I doing this is actually a way for a developer to say, I could do it this other way and it would be better. So you might have to you know, have some conversations and, and figure out, uh, uh, you know, make sure that everyone knows how their piece fits into the, the overall picture. Uh, and lastly for, for this, uh, just want to, you know, just a nice reminder, developers aren't just resources, we're, we're people too. Uh, so check in with developers uh, and, and make sure that they're happy on the project. Um, you know, sometimes what we do isn't uh, innovative and exciting, sometimes it's just, you know, uh, just to be totally honest, sometimes we're just building a website. Uh, you know, just, but just make sure that developers are uh, they're engaged and, and they're happy on that project. And, and talk with developers about things that aren't the project. Uh, you know, get to know them, build a rapport. Uh, that, that helps build the, the team morale, the camaraderie of the team, of the project team. And that can have, have great payoffs uh, maybe when a project goes sideways and people have to work a little more than, than they'd like. Uh, so, uh, you know, takeaways for this would be, you know, help developers be productive as much as possible while maintaining good balance in their lives, uh, helping them maintain balance in their lives. And, you know, make sure developers know how what they're doing advances uh, the project, it advances the uh, larger goals for the organization, uh, and, and let them know, <clears throat> you know, that, that their work is, is meaningful uh, in many ways. So, uh, here, here's the... Um, kind of the last section for this presentation, and this is uh, me as a project manager and as a, a, a lead uh, at HS2 uh, and as a, a practice leader uh, at um, uh, other organizations. Some things that I've, I've seen and uh, want to, to uh, describe for you about how I see how project managers can help uh, with efficiency. And most of these are probably review for the the more astute project managers in the group, especially since I've heard a lot of this information in other sessions at this con. So uh, we'll try to cover these pretty quick. Uh, one is, is don't allow a site build to start too soon. Uh, sometimes I know there's a lot of pressure, particularly when timelines and deadlines are involved, to start building before scope and requirements are fully locked down. 
Uh, push back against this as much as possible. It helps avoid rework and unscoped work and um, having to tear things down and, and build them again in a different way. Uh, and also, if, if, you need, if you need some leverage to get sign off on something or to get some resources, this is kind of like your last carrot to say, okay, we're not gonna build until we get this thing from you. So that, that's uh, one item. Uh, next is um, some, of, uh, some of us developers are a little ambitious at times, uh, so you might wanna try to wrangle them in a little bit. Uh, developers can get really excited about wanting to try new things or new approaches or use a new technology. And at times that's really good. It's really good to encourage innovation, but uh, on some projects with uh, tight timelines or smaller budgets that may not be in the cards. So in, you know, staying the course may be, may be beneficial in that case. And also um, tease out when developers are having problems. Um, you know, use stand-ups and status meetings uh, to ask questions about you know, do you, need any, do you need any help to complete this task? You know, do you have all the information that you need? Um, it, you know, and just, just ask point blank, are you spinning your wheels on this? Are you like, you know, are you stuck in that decision paralysis? Do you need, you know, to talk with another developer to work through some issues uh, related to a technical approach? Um, also find out if, uh, you know, they're getting sideswiped by other people within the organization, uh, you know, for doing, um, you know, either, uh, working on another project or doing a business proposal or something like that. Um, and definitely, and I think this is a common thread for, for this con in the project management track, is have transparency with the whole team. Uh, don't, don't shield developers. Uh, me personally, I, I don't like being shielded from the numbers. I want to know uh, how the, the project is going, you know, number of, you know, the velocity of, of the completion or uh, how we're working against the budget. I find that information really helpful for me and it helps as a developer me know, um, you know, if, if I need to um, work a little, little quicker, uh, you know, to maybe find ways to shave some time off of, of some tickets. So it's very helpful and it keeps everyone abreast of, of the latest information, how the client is feeling. Um, and uh, I think last for this would be um, let developers show off their own work. Don't, you know, not all developers want to be behind the scenes. Some do, and that's okay. Um, me personally, I like having that great one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with, with the client. So when, you, when you're demoing something, you know, let the, let the developer that built the thing do the demo uh, for the client or the stakeholder. It builds, it builds ownership. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about you want people that take ownership. This is a great way to instill ownership. It's you're going to be showing the client this thing that you built, this page that you built, this module that you built. Uh, so it, it gives the developer pride to show that off, gives them ownership to make sure that that is done uh, as well as possible. And it helps build rapport with the client, um, especially if the stakeholders that you're dealing with are other IT people. Um, it can really spur some great conversations, and it can even, um, you know, spur discussions about new work uh, to be done in a future phase. So, you know, for for the project managers, you know, look for, you know, the, look at the project management process and see how you can help increase efficiency when dealing with Drupal projects. And also, you know, work with the developers, help them become more efficient in so far as you can, and help them elevate their, their craft. And, and finally, you know, kind of the takeaways, uh, hopefully for you uh, in this presentation will be, you know, know, first is know where your team stands uh, currently related to skills and experience. Um, determine some next steps for the Drupal practice to help it increase efficiency. And, uh, you know, implement those, those changes into the Drupal process and the project management process. Uh, implement changes that, that do facilitate uh, better efficiency so that you, as a team, can be more, more productive. Uh, and with that, one thing, uh, two, two housekeeping things. You may have heard there are some contribution sprints uh, tomorrow. You don't have to be a developer to contribute. If, if you're not technical uh, with Drupal, you can help write documentation. Uh, or, or things like that. And um, I'd really like some feedback on this presentation. Hopefully you learned one or two little nuggets uh, that you can take back to your, to your home base. Uh, on the screen here is the link to the survey. And finally, thank you. I appreciate your time.
And if you have any questions or if you have any information to share that may help others in the room, uh, there's a microphone over here, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, what, what tools do, do we use uh, to help facilitate collaboration? Uh, at, at HS2 uh, Solutions, we, we're in on the, the Atlassian suite, so we use Jira, Confluence. Uh, th those are the keys, the two biggest ones that we, that we use for collaboration and task management. No, we, we do include the clients on those, and, and they don't have access to every facet. Uh, they can get reports. They can see, like, the current sprint, uh, you know, the swim lanes on the current sprint. We use a command board for that. Uh, but we, we do include them on that. And typically, typically uh, we have a few points of contact that have access to that uh, on the client side. Uh, everyone on the team at HS2 has access, but uh, maybe one or two key people like a project manager on that side or a key stakeholder on that side has access. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll just repeat it. Okay. Yeah, the, the question was, um, when someone has bench time between projects, uh, how do you keep them motivated uh, and, and not have some large-scale internal investment on things? Um, at HS2, we, um, when someone does have, we call it bench time, uh, that we, we uh, offer, you know, we, have, we have a project board that's internal, that is uh, improvements to our, our, our base installation or to our development environment. And we'll, we'll, we'll try to put people, in, you know, to, to do things on that. It could be like, you know, add some scaffolding for uh, creating, you know, this type of page or that type of, of page. Uh, so just little things that, that can be bite-sized so that if someone only has a day or two of, of downtime between one, you know, project moving on to another one, there, there are something that they can do. And, um, you know, the, it, it, you, you mentioned doing research, you know, going back to, to that. Uh, definitely the investment in the continued growth, um, you know, have them take a course but, or, or take a class. But the, the flip side is we'll, we'll pay for you to take that course, but you're going to do an info share with the group about what you learned. And, and you know that that can be helpful as well because you do you do have that that actual cost of, of someone not being billable, uh, but at least you can get some some payback for the entire group by learning uh, what they do. Is that helpful? Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, we, um, that, that can be a challenge, especially for the rock stars uh, that are, are like wanted on every project. I'm sorry? Oh, oh, the question is, how do you make sure that developers have that time for their own investment in, um, in, in growing their knowledge and, and experience? Uh, and it, it can be a challenge, again, like when the, um, when you have the rock star developers that, that every project manager wants on that project, on their project. Uh, and you know, it, it, you, you have to be regimented and say, okay, one day a month, the equivalent of one day a month or two days a month, uh, we're setting aside uh, for you to you know, invest in yourself, to do professional development. Um, and you know, that's, that's a, a one good way. And we also, we do hackathons and uh, other uh, kind of lunch and learns, uh, we call them where everyone gets, gets lunch and, and tries to learn something over lunch. 
so you know there are there are definitely opportunities. You just have to, for some people, you have to be creative and and be very deliberate about how you do that for them, so that they're they do have that opportunity to do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, um, to answer the first question, no, I can't share it. Okay. Um, uh, but a guide that I will give you is look at the Acquia certification tests. They have study guides. That's a good, good guide mark to use uh, for creating that. Um, and uh, you know, we 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 did a couple of different things. Uh, one is um, the Drupal practice lead at HS2 um, evaluated everybody. Uh, I'm not the Drupal practice lead at, at HS2. Uh, and then we also had everyone evaluate themselves. Uh, that's good reflective time for a developer to to sit back and, and acknowledge, you know, where, where their strengths are. And you might find areas, uh, you know, that someone says, oh, I know a lot about this thing, but they've never been asked or they never spoke up. So that, that's one good way. And based on that, uh, you know, we, we kind of did some trends and said, okay, we're kind of light in, you know, this area or that area. And that gives us a good... Um, place to, to focus some effort. So then when someone does have some bench time, a day or two of bench time, we can say, why don't you do a little research on, you know, this, uh, on the new workflow initiative or the new media uh, that's coming out so that, that we, we know we have someone who has researched and has hands-on experience with it, even in a sandbox, uh, and someone that can, can help elevate everyone's knowledge on that. And there, I think there was another question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, forecasting and pipelines are out of my realm of experience, so I, I don't think I could provide a meaningful answer for you for that. Uh, that would be the, the practice lead uh, at, at HS2 um, and, and, you know, other practice leads within our company. They work on that. Mm -hmm. Do you take that a bit further in terms of, in terms of uh, C patterns, in terms of some things you build that start doing something approaching distribution or other sorts of installation profiles or any other other ways of seeing? We, we, we have um, done something very similar. Uh, we, we have productized some of our, our work. Uh, we keep it outside of the installation profile. Uh, but we, we have a, a few things, a few tricks up our sleeves of, as far as um, some layout management and, and that that we've productized so that when a client uh, has something that, uh, that has a desire to, to have something that fits what we do or what we have that product for, we can use that as, and say, you know, for X dollars, this is what, what you get and then we'll build on that and customize it for you. That, that is you know, speaking of efficiency, that's like ridiculously efficient because we sell it for a price and we just turn it on and then configure it and, uh, you know, customize it for them. So it's a mix of like having a profile, mm -hmm. install profile, mm -hmm. plus a few reusable Yes. Yeah, and we, and we haven't gone the full distro, you know, the full-fledged distro route just because uh, sometimes, um, you know, sites kind of diverge. Uh, and go off in their own little ways that don't fit nicely with a distro, and we don't want to have problems with that uh, down the road if we need to build in, you know, if we need to do some updates or, or something like that. So you can have profiles Yeah, it's flexible enough for what we, what we do, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the great presentation. Um, two questions 
related to kind of just very practical communications. Uh, what's the best intervention tactic when someone says that we'll fix it in QA or UAT? Do you throw uh, <laughs> uh, like a pencil at the person or do you say that let's reconsider or uh, approach that? I, I would say, you know, oh, we'll fix that in QA. Um, no, we won't. We'll, we'll fix that now. Uh, and, and, you know, just being direct and in maybe explain, you know, kind of how I described, if we let this bug linger, it's going to cause, it can cause more problems uh, and just really explain the why for that. And, uh, yeah, it, it can be hard to, like, shove a bug ticket into a, a really tight sprint, uh, but it, it's something that, that needs to be done mm. uh, for, for the overall health of the project. Okay. And this probably goes also to the uh, explaining the why, but you mentioned that if there's kind of demands and pressure in certain situations, you try to push back. But I was just thinking, how do you do that while still keeping the stakeholders happy? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's something for the project managers to manage. <laughs> and not, and uh, I, will, I will happily punt to the, to the group here if you have any, any tips or tricks on that. Push, pushing back on, on uh, pressure for starting a build with a tight deadline um, and, 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 and keeping the client happy at the same time. Thank you. How do you, I work for a small agency, mm -hmm. large developer, and uh, we have new or long, long, project, long, long term projects, and at the same time we have the support mm -hmm. going on that we don't know when it's coming. And how do you organize a more efficient to keep things work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a balancing act. It's 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 hard. Uh, you know, you can you can go and say, okay, you know, developer, maybe junior developer, we're putting you on maintenance until you know you, you build up some skills. But then that can be kind of feel like you know pigeonholing them or siloing them into that, uh, and, that and that definitely can be demotivating. Um, I've experienced uh, that with some other developers uh, that I've worked with uh, in other organizations. Uh, you know. I, th I think time boxing uh, for maintenance tasks uh, is good. Uh, you mean obviously, it, yeah, yeah, if number of hours over the course of a of, of a sprint. You know, you know, even on maintenance, we try to do two week iterations and say, um, you know, obviously, if your site crashes or if there's a critical bug, we'll fix it as soon as we can. But you know, if we have this backlog of things that we want that we know you want to get done, let's pick three things that we'll do. And if something else more important comes in, you let us know and we'll get, you know, we'll, we'll prioritize that above the others. But otherwise, within the next two weeks, we'll have these three things done. Um, and we, we try to do it that way. And, and if, if you bake in uh, kind of the assumption that, yes, Mr. Client, Ms. Client, uh, you have X number of hours with us per month, um, you know, and they're use it or lose it, then, um, then you know, the client will be motivated to make sure that they're staying on top of requests and, and new features that they want. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, good documentation uh, is definitely helpful. We we don't have any any kind of visuals on on technical debt. Um, we probably should uh, just to keep it top of mind when when we do have some some bench time or you know a client does have some some time with us that they 
uh, want to, to use and they don't know exactly what for, we can help try to reduce some of that debt. Um, but you know, we, I don't know that I have anything really specific that I can, can offer for you on that. <laughs> I think I think it's a I think it's a common problem everyone has and yeah. no one knows how to quite slice that up yet. Yeah, yeah. Nice tote board of technical debt would be uh, would be good. See that every day when you walk in. <laughs> all right. Well, we're at time right now. So again, thank you everyone for for coming. I'll I'll hang around up here if you have any questions. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I want to listen in on this. Uh, 